sure that you've been told And you need that info Sanera TV Sanera TV Tune in the consciousness and watch the lies fall Then you can let the truth flow Sanera TV Sanera TV When you feel that melanin about to explode Like you feel the wind blow It's Sanera TV Sanera TV the truth, but you can get more, so you continue to grow. To grow. Sunnetta TV, Sunnetta TV. And Black Power family, welcome to another Sarnetta TV House of Consciousness production. You already know what it is, man. When I come up in here, you know I'm bringing something powerful. I'm bringing somebody powerful, and we're gonna all uh, see if we can spark that thought, spark your mind for thought. You know what I'm saying? And um, I would like to bring to you. You already know him. He really needs no introduction. But for those of y'all who may be a little slow, dealing with slow gases, you know what I'm saying? Who are not caught up on anything, I bring to you our brother, your brother. Brother Lamont in the building. What's going on, Lamont Hill? Unmute yourself, and we can get this thing going. What's up, good brothers? Good to be back, man. You know, man, I good to see you. I see you got your library behind you. That's that's good, man. We know that you are well astute and caught up on history and knowledge and information. How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. You know, it's funny. The last time I was on the show, I got so much uh, response, man. It was it was dope, man. I, you know, for years. I've been watching this and and wanting to be a part of it, so it was dope to be a part of it. And, and honestly, the feedback I got, some of it was negative, a lot of it was positive, and and the conversations that get sparked from it, I think, is important. So I'm. Oh I'm, man, I built. see my man Lord Abbott in the building. I wish I could have brought him through. Maybe when I finish this, I could send him the link because he he's definitely. I think he's a supporter of you, and he wanted to uh probably get a little political with you as well. That's my brother, Lord Abbott, in the building. Okay, okay. And so, family, you already see what the title is. I got, I, I named the title. Lamont didn't do this. I did it. It's called Lamont Hill versus anybody on the topic of Dr. York. So if you want to step out the window, jump out the window and challenge the brother on what he's saying, that's up to you, brother. I mean, you could jump out there if you want to. This <laughs> is a man who had been rolling with Dr. York for a minute. So he probably was in it when you wasn't even uh, even in it. You see what I'm saying? So be careful. That's why I'm saying you might jump out this window. You know what I'm saying? So any any event, brother, before we even get to the Dr. York, I want to ask you this. Um, you have you have never shied away from speaking your mind, um, speaking your mind on no on no contra on any controversial levels. No. Nah. Talk to us, talk to us about. The comment you made about um, the Palestinian Israel Israelis conflict that led you to being, you know, fired from your position. Yeah, talk yeah. to us about that. You know, I, I I always believe that as oppressed people, we got to stand in solidarity with other oppressed people. Uh, you know, one of the questions and I remember I saw uh, the brother uh, Pharaoh when he was on. One of the things he said is, "Why would I be all the way over there worrying about them?" You know, when is when is uh, as he put it, niggas over here that's going through stuff, and he's right. There's, there's, there's our brothers and sisters over here dealing with stuff, and I spend the bulk of my time in love and service to our people here in the United States. Um, but I also believe that there's a relationship between what's happening here in the United States and what's happening overseas, and that we can't dismantle um, systems of oppression if we only focus on the United States, right? As African people, we have to think about ourselves as part of a global system. Think about what the messenger said, right? Think about the lessons, right? The idea was that we are, that that, that, that we are, the, the idea of the Asiatic black man, right? Who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet earth, the father of civilization, the God of the universe. That very idea says that we are part of a global community, right? Think about, th think about the one in 36, the English lessons, right? From my name is W.F. Muhammad, I came to North America by myself, right? My uncle was brought here by the trade. When you're going through those lessons, you start from somewhere else and you're coming here, 
right? And when he asked the question, how many Muslims are there? Right? Not Muslim sons, but Muslims. The question was, how are we thinking globally about this? So for me, when I think about myself as a black man, I think about myself as part of as part of an Afro-Asiatic community, right? I think of myself as part of an African, Pan-African tradition. I think about part of myself as a community of oppressed people. Um, Dr. York, just as another example, right? I mean, he had us look into Sudan. He had us look into Egypt or Kemet. He had us looking around the world as he should have. Um, all these teachers, and Marcus Garvey, the Honorable Marcus Musayi Garvey had us looking globally. So for me, the global perspective is, is part of our tradition. The reason why I focus on the Palestinians in particular, and it's not only the Palestinians, I think about what's happening in Uganda, I think about what's happening in Botswana, I think about what's happening in Sudan, I think about what's happening in South Africa, I think about what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire, I think about what's happening in Ghana, Senegal, Nigeria. I, and, and when people watch my show and the work I do around the world, I'm focused on all these issues. I spent the last month or two talking about what's happening in Ethiopia uh, with the Tigray. So it's not just the Palestinian question, but the Palestinians are an oppressed people. The Palestinians uh, are part of a settler colonial project, the same settler colonial project that had Native Americans here in the United States erased, had their land taken, violence visited upon them. That's the same thing that's happening to Palestinians right now. And so for me, when I see my Palestinian brothers and sisters, I say, we got to do something. Malcolm X made two major uh, world trips. And in the second trip, he visited Egypt, he visited uh, Palestine, and he wrote an essay in the Egyptian Gazette called On Zionist Logic. So Malcolm was saying, we got to think about Palestine. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad set foot there and said, we got to think about Palestine. So for me, it's- But let me ask you this though. Um, yeah. Why is it that we always got to be the people to think about other nations. Do you think Palestine give a damn about us for real, for real? Because I don't see them in our struggle. I don't see them fighting for rights for black people. Why do we always got to be the one to jump out the window and get on the front line? Because to me, it seems like we fight more for other nationalities and other races than ourselves. We're the one going through hell right now. Yeah, I mean, I think a whole bunch of people are going through hell, but you're right. I mean, I think our priority has to be us. Black folk got to right. prioritize black folk. That's the first thing. But my point is my analysis of how to fix black people can't be disconnected from the global. I can't stop white supremacy if I only do it around the borders of the United States because white supremacy is a global project. Like white, like capitalism is a global project. So we can't fix it without supporting each other. I'm with you though. I, one of the main messages I give to Palestinian people is y'all got to be here with us. I can't just be out here fighting for Palestine if y'all not at the Black Lives Matter rally. I can't be out here. There you go. Yeah, yeah. This, this shit got to go both ways. And, and, and they have to understand that. I also don't want to overstate how much, it's not like a whole bunch of Black people supporting Palestine. I think in both cases, I think we have parallel struggles. I think that we haven't been on each other's side enough. But when I was in Ferguson in 2014 and we were getting tear gas, we were, I was on those streets. Uh, I remember one moment I saw uh, Malik Zulu Shabazz because they was he'll tell you, I, I'd rather let him tell that story because I don't know what he want to tell or not. But we was on those streets and shit was happening and we was getting tear gas and we couldn't see and the, and the police were moving in on us. And, and, and the message I got on how to protect myself from tear gas, how to wrap my eyes, how to clean my eyes, how to stand closer to the, that came from Palestine. It was Palestinians in the West Bank who sent messages to black activists through social media and said, look, we know tear gas. We know violence. We know what it's like to get hit by police in this way because they've been bombing us every day. So here's what y'all black people in the United States can do to protect yourselves. Let's start working together. So for me, 2014 was a turning point where I did start to see the Palestinian movement move closer to us and we and us closer to them. So I'm excited by energy, but I'm with you. I still see anti-blackness in that community. I still see anti-blackness in the United States. When I go to Detroit or Chicago or New York and I see pal uh, I see uh, store owners and how they treat us in the store, they, they occupy the hood in a certain kind of way. So I'm talking to them about that and I'm talking to us about how we can organize and, and, and move forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, so now um, the question that I ask you, you feel that this is the reason why they had to get rid of you because you was trying to bridge that gap. You was really talking about the United between the blacks and the Palestine. Palestinians. I think whenever black people are internationalist, um, the world gets scared. Yeah. When Malcolm says, I'm going to bring the United States on charges in international <laughs> yeah. bodies, right? When Martin, when Martin says, you know, um, on August, uh, April, excuse me, April 4th of 67, um, in 63, right? Martin Luther King is a hero. 
when he's telling niggas not to not to swing back, you know, you know, to, to be nonviolent when he's talking about a certain kind of image of America through a nonviolent practice. He's a hero by 67 when he gives that speech of why he opposes the war in Vietnam. Right. And he's saying the same spirit that says I'm going to be nonviolent to white folk. I got to also oppose this Vietnamese war. I don't care what the American state says. He talked about racism, militarism and poverty as, as a triplet. Right. Of misery, a triplicate, a triplet of misery, meaning that, again, we can't solve the problem here if we don't understand the international context. My point is. When when Martin does that, he becomes an enemy of the state. And on why he gives a speech on April 4th in Riverside of 67, April 4th of 68, they shoot him down. So internationally, when black folk move in international spaces, you start to see different conversations. They're OK if we talking to each other in the hood about shit. But when we start moving internationally, globally, it's something different. Right. Um, let me ask you, brother, you have been a voice for black people. Um, you have been a voice for our people on news channels from CNN to Fox to BET. Is news news on every media outlet or is is reaching platforms working, trying to shut us down or trying to shut agendas down? You know, it's an interesting question. The, the... <sighs> The first thing trying I trying to like really censor us, you know. I don't think it's like a conspiracy behind this. Like I've never been in a, in a and again, you could say I wouldn't be in that room anyway. But I've been in some newsrooms and I've been I've seen some stories. The problem is, a lot of times people think about the news is just what's how you tell a story. It's how you tell a story. It's which stories get told because I can talk about a bombing in in France. And that story needs to be told. But there's a bombing happening in Lebanon at the same time. There's a bombing happening in Nigeria at the same time. There's a, there's a shooting happening in Chicago. And we're not telling that story. So the news picks winners and losers by telling the world what stories are worth telling, what communities exist. So if I watch Sunday TV, if I only watch Sunday TV, I would think the whole world was talking about Hebrew Israelites. And I think the whole world was talking about five percenters. The whole world was talking about New Orleans because that would be my whole universe. And the reason why your, your 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 platform is so important is because the rest of the world ain't talking about that. So when I, if I if I just watch mainstream news, I would think the only people existed were white people. I would think the only stories that mattered were their stories. The only thing that the world was fighting about was gay marriage and and voting rights and 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 and, and COVID vaccines. And and there's a whole lot of other stuff happening. So part of what the news is doing is is it's less about censoring us per se and more about saying picking the stories that we're going to tell and picking who gets to be a storyteller, who gets to be a witness, who gets to be a voice. And, and, and so that's why I'm always trying to fight to expand that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still on the news. I'm still on mainstream news platforms. And what I try to do is bring different voices. So you don't hear the same people and see the same people. Right. Um, I don't know if you ever saw this movie. I watched it for the first time last night. It's a new one. You can catch. I seen it on, on Paramount. I think it's on Netflix. I want to encourage everybody under the sound of my voice. Trust me when I tell you this. You got to look at the movie American Skin. Mm, I ain't seen it. Dropping a lot of powerful information in that movie. So I don't know who <laughs> watched it yet. I'm going to see in the comments. You got to look at American Skin, y'all. If y'all ain't got nothing to do tonight, please watch that movie. They going in. Dropping mad science in what that movie. Know, what's, 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 the, what's, the, what's it about? Well, um, it's it's about uh the police. I don't want to give it all away. Uh, I don't want to give it away to our people. But you got to watch it to the end, bro. The joint is fire. It's bad. The uh, joint is bad. I'm, I'm see, somebody out. already said American Skin was good. Oh, shit. But see, don't just look at it for the entertainment. Look mm -hmm. at it for the entertainment, but also look at it for the information that they're giving you because they're giving you a lot of stuff about schools, about um. They talking about public schools and private schools and why his kid wasn't in the public school. They going in. Oh, they wow. going in, bro. Oh, I got yeah. I got to see. I'll give you one thing. The cop that killed one of his sons. I I can't do it because it right, ended right, up making me. Away, away, yeah, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it away. All right. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Yeah, the end. I, oh, the end wasn't whack. You missed it. That's why you saying the end was whack. He made it public for the world to see change and what's going on with racism. You got to see it for yourself. So let me ask you this, brother. As a teen, you met the late, great Kobe Bryant as a basket in basketball camp one day. 
and you stay good friends with him until his untimely end. With all due respect, what can you share with us about Kobe? And have you seen or heard in anything in the headlines that probably condemn him or, you know, anything? What can you share with us about Kobe Bryant? You was good friends with him. Kobe was a uh, was a different dude, man. He was he was special in a way that um, it's hard to even even capture in words. I met Kobe when we was um, we about about thirteen. We was in Philly at basketball game. Matter of fact, it was me, him, and Kevin Hart all was at the same basketball camp at the same time. Mm -hmm. Just coincidental, just like just some random coincidence, right? And I, I knew I actually ended up knowing spending more time around Kevin in high school. Cause we played for different, we played for competing high schools and we worked out together a little bit in the summers. Uh, but I, I stayed in touch with Kobe because Kobe was just phenomenal. Kobe is, me and Kobe are the same age. Kobe, Kobe is, uh, he's born in August, uh, I'm December. So we like just a few months apart. And first of all, Kobe was better than everybody back then. We would sneak into the gym at Temple University to work out in the summertime. And the college players would be playing each other. And some of the pros would come down and play. And Kobe was like, we was, I met, you know, I, actually I met Kobe going into 10th grade. So the end of ninth grade going into 10th grade. So by 11th grade, Kobe, <laughs> Kobe was playing against Eddie Jones, who ended up, who was a star at Temple, was about to get drafted by the Lakers as a lottery pick. He was in the game with them. He was in the game with Aaron McKee. He was in the game with Rick Brunson, who ended up playing for the Knicks for a little bit back when the Knicks was halfway decent. And they was all hooping, and Kobe. Remember, Kobe is eleventh grade, and he is cooking these dudes, man. He 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 wasn't the best player on the court, but you couldn't tell that he didn't belong. These Division One stars, all Americans and NBA pros, and he looked just like he fit. The first day I met Kobe, we was playing. Uh, we was at basketball camp at LaSalle University, and Randy Woods, who played for LaSalle and got drafted by the Bucks, came out in the basketball camp. The NBA player said, who want to play me one-on-one? -on -one? You know what I mean? And then, you know, you play the kid to five, you beat him, you teach him he ain't ready, you know, and all this shit, right? Well, everybody, he he, he, he beat a couple of us, you know, five nothing, five nothing, five nothing. <laughs> he said, so we was like, play him. So Kobe get up, you know, again, he, we like 15, 14, 15 at the time, 15, 16, yeah, he's 15 at the time, maybe 14, 15. And he played Randy Wood. Again, he just got drafted. This is an NBA lottery pick. And he played him. Kobe gave him buckets. Game go to five. He, he Kobe scored the first three. Then Randy got serious. Like, all right, I'm gonna just have to show this kid. He gave him a couple. It was four to four. I don't remember who won, but I think they stopped the game before Kobe could win because they didn't want this high school kid to show up this NBA lottery pick at his home at, on wow. the side of the court. That's how good this nigga was. Then another thing about Kobe, I'll tell you, he worked out. We all played ball in high school. We all worked out. We all was was, was bas you know, just into basketball. After your high school practice, after your high school game, we would go to St. Joe's, the Green Gym. If you could play, you go to Green Gym at LaSalle and work out. Kobe would do a whole other routine. He would shoot a few more thousand shots. He would do all this shit that, like, we didn't even know how to do. Now, some of that was because Pop was, you know, was a pro. You know what I mean? So he had resources we didn't have. But he was also just better than everybody else. And we would play Kobe every – I played Kobe every day. In my senior year, junior year, we played Kobe. Me, him, and his cousin, uh, John Cox. Uh, his – uh, John Cox, who's father. Well, wasn't Kobe too big for you, though? Tall, I mean, in stature. Tall. I mean, we was playing one on one. Uh, we played a game called Kyle's. Game go, game go to one. First person okay. score, right? So it was really a drill to to work on like one on one skills and, and right. defense, right? Yeah, he was too big. It, Kobe could have been five ten. He would have been too big for me. I'm five. I'm I'm, I'm five ten. It didn't matter, right? That and, and his cousin was about 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 six feet at the time, and we would rotate in first person score win. I might play Kobe one on one five hundred times. I never, I never got that, never got that point off. You know what I mean? And, it, and 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 I remember I had ball first. I could just shoot a jumper and then go in. But he was so intense, and he never wanted to lose. He never took a possession off. He never. Kobe was on some other shit. I watched him shoot left hand free throws and and three pointers for like a half hour in high school. Mm. Just drill, just practice, just practice, just practice. Right. Um, dude said I'm capping because I'm five ten. Okay, um, that's dumb shit to cap off. But um, so 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 then we uh, I remember one day Kobe got his hand broke in an NBA game, and he went to shoot the free throw. He had broke his right hand, and he shot the free throw left handed, right? And I remember, and I, at that moment, I remember thinking about how when we were teenagers, he was working on that shit. Now, right. 
All I'm of like, it come to play now. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, the level of preparation. And, and I don't even know if he made the freeze. I think he missed it, actually. But the idea that he was prepared for a moment like that, that would never come. He could have just came out the game. I'm looking at the comments. Yeah, it's a conversation, fam. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to look at the comments. Um, so, um, so we we had a, a, a love for the game. And it wasn't just, I'm talking about even guys who went pro didn't have Kobe's love for the game and Kobe's preparation for the game. And Kobe, that's all he did. You know what I mean? We, you'd be at the barbershop, he talking ball. He doing, she doing footwork and shit. Like you at a party, he, he ready to go back to the gym. Like that's, that's how he moved. That's how he thought about the game. And that's why he's better than everybody else. At the time, like um, the time of his death, did it feel like a piece of you was missing when you found out? Cause I did, I never met him personally. But I, it felt so deep within my heart. I was fucked because up because he was he was a good man. He was a good brother. To I me. was fucked up. The last time I saw Cole was at the BET Awards two years prior, mm. and we was backstage just talking, you know. And um, and I and I had never. It might have been a couple. Might have been three years because he, he he was you know yeah it, it was a couple years before. And I remember because uh, he hadn't retired yet, but he was about to. And I was like, yo, what the fuck are you gonna do? Like that's all I've ever. He's like, yo, I'm I'm finally ready to not play ball. Like I, I I've accepted life without basketball. I had never seen him more at peace. He loved coaching his daughter. He mm -hmm. loved coaching, you know, basketball. He was ready in a way that um I had never seen before. Um and so when I saw and I, and I had went to the game because I go to all the Sixers games. I was at the game and I had just seen his cousin at the game uh, the night that LeBron passed him because he died the night after LeBron passed him. That game was in Philly. So I was at the Sixers game and I was trying to hit Kobe up after LeBron passed him um, to just to fuck with him. You know what I mean? And I ended up, I didn't get a hold of him. The next day was a Sunday and um, I got a text saying Kobe, I know I saw on Twitter Kobe had died. And I thought it was a joke because LeBron. Mm, me too. Passed. Me too. Yep. Yeah. I was like, oh, this nigga, the, you know, Kobe. Just, I mean, LeBron just passed. Ain't trying to say Kobe. I thought it was a joke. Then I saw it again. Then I saw it again. Then I saw it again. And I was like, what the fuck it. So I called his family. I called his cousin. And um, he wasn't answering the phone. Then I called his, his other cousin. And no, no phone answer. Uh, I eventually got somebody on the phone who confirmed it for me. But, and then I was just, I was done, man. Like, I, 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 I. It, it's still hard to deal with yeah. the idea that somebody because it also makes your own mortality, right? Because again, like we only a few months apart, so um, the idea that somebody I'm like this he can't be dead, right? We we was just at the gym, we was just in high school, we was just talking about the prom. This nigga, I remember when he got the Land Cruiser, you know what I mean? Twelfth grade, you know what I mean? I'm like still cycling them 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 the memories around, and and it's like yo, he's gone now, and that shit fucks you up because you start thinking about. That, that could be your life, that could be you. Um, and I thought about him losing his family, I thought about the people who loved him, I thought about the game losing him. But most importantly, I just thought about yo, this is a brother who I loved and knew and who's gone too soon. Right. Yeah. Um, what about what about your um take on do you um what do you think about the conspiracy surrounding his death? Like, oh, uh, maybe the helicopter man was in on it. To me, I look at it like all oh, stupid foolishness. It is, you know. The helicopter man was in on it. Why would he want to kill himself and kill his life? Like, ain't nobody right. killing themselves. I mean, people right. run helicopters in fog all the time, and it's a bad choice. It's like driving without a seatbelt or driving. What are some of the crazy conspiracies you heard, brother? I mean, I mean it, I, it's bullshit. Like, like there was no, there was no people saying he had the black mamba uh, vitamin company, and they, you know, or, or there was a black mamba uh, uh, some pills or some shit, and and they killed him so that they could get the title. I was like, none of that made sense. The truth is something really unfortunate happened to somebody we love and and, and black folk have a, a long tradition of, of of trying to figure out and make sense of death just like white folk do white folk didn't want to let elvis go so they still got him on the island somewhere buddy holly marilyn Monroe, they still pretend they on the island somewhere we did that with tupac he's still alive we want to believe that the people we love are alive and so the conspiracy theories give us something so i don't ever like clown people who got conspiracy theories but i promise you kobe bryant was is really dead unfortunately and I, I, I'm confident that there was no conspiracy. I think it's as simple as somebody did something real dumb, which was ride fly the helicopter, and he, and he died. Yes, I agree, man. Um, speaking of your childhood, let's go back in time um, in the New Wabians set when you was a part of the New Wabians. And let's talk about those actually who support Dr. York. Why are so many people still 
claiming his innocence, even though he pleaded guilty? I, I don't know. I, you know, I wish I had a good answer for that, brother. I, I, again, I think we want to believe in something, right? People want to believe in religion. They want to believe in false gods. They want to believe in spaceships. They want to believe in people living in the bellies of whales. People want to believe in, I'm talking about whatever your religious tradition is. If you're in the phase of religion, you you, you will invest in a belief in something that's not substantiated or real. And I think the irony of Dr. York for me is that while he has shown people how to dismantle those systems, he's shown people how to dismantle Christianity. He's shown people how to break down Islam. He's shown people how to break down these traditions. I got 360 questions for the Muslims, the Christians, the Israelites, the Israeli church. You know, I got questions for, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses. I got, I'm going to break down the, you know, I'm going to have the book of the five percenters. I was just reading that a few minutes ago. The, the book of the five percenters. I'm going to have, you know, all these books dismantling that logic. For many people, they replaced those religions with Dr. York as the religion. He becomes the person who's flawless. He becomes the person who is above reproach. He becomes the person who we don't fact check. We fact check everything but him, right? So that we say, well, he said it. So that's it, right? And they'll say we did our research, but the research we often do is actually just what he said the research said, right? And so I think that's a big part of it. And so, and for the people who are still holding on, I think some people have found a way to balance that and say, look, I believe in this part of what the doctrine said, but I don't accept that. For others, it's everything he said is 100% right and exact. I believe it. He said it. That settles. I mean, it sounds just like an evangelical Christian. Um, and that and that's something different to me. You know, um, when you talked about Dr. York, it really shocked a lot of people. They didn't know you was involved in the Nuwabian community. They didn't know it. I'm reading the comments, and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know he was with this. I didn't know he was with that group. Can you... Can you go a little deeper? Tell us when you became a member, why you became a member, why did you join, and when did you leave? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I, I want to clear up something else that, that came up in, in, in the conversation too. Um, I I was at a very young age reading the materials. Mm -hmm. You know, I, at a very young age, I was reading the books. Uh, there was a brother, Amin Ab Abdullah, um, who was very well known in the, in the, in the Philly uh, community. He was an old school Ansar who eventually he actually passed away, in, I believe, uh, in Athens. He was definitely he was up. He was near Pops. He was near Dr. York at when he passed away. He finally made the move. Um, but as a kid, I was reading the books and even going past the masjid on 52nd Street. Um, but I was not yet a member. Um, I, um, I was down, I was around, you know, um, as time went on, I read more. And again, my brother was a 5% so he was bringing me all kinds of materials. I was reading the lessons. I was reading this, I was reading that, trying to figure it out. Um, and as the doctrine was shifting, you know, I had already taken Shahada, um, after reading Malcolm. So I was already Muslim and trying to make sense of the Ansar stuff at the same time that the Ansar community was shifting outside of, of Islam in the way that it had. It was like kind of a Ansar phase to Nubia Islam, a Hebrew phase to a eventually a HTM phase. It was by the time in my mid-teens to that it was moving toward HTM that I would say I got super involved. That's when I started, you know, going to every class. That's when I started studying. That's when I started buying all the books. I moved to Atlanta uh, uh, and then started um, going uh, the um, uh, ML, Martin Luther King Boulevard, Martin Luther King Drive, excuse me, um, bookstore was being set up my freshman year at, um, at Morehouse. Um, I helped start that store. I literally painted the store with other brothers. I literally helped set it up. The Edgewood store was already there. So I was going to Edgewood for class and opening up. I was selling and turning in for the for the uh for the Martin Luther, for the Martin Luther King store 
Um, I then eventually started setting up and, and set up a different one further down MLK that I was the primary on, meaning that I was the one who made the delivered the orders to the land. I was the one that um, took that make took the phone calls from from the office. Um, I was from the sisters in the office. I was the one who did the stuff. Um, before this idea that uh, I think I think brother Farrell shout out to Farrell I actually like that brother a lot and learn a lot from him when he talks and I want to um, continue to um, um, build with the brother. Um, he said that I was like the dollar cab uh, for people making the trip from Atlanta to Eatonton. That's not true. Um, I wasn't just a driver. I wasn't just driving people. Uh, I was driving Dr. York's guests and Dr. York's acts because remember for, at, at, there came a point where he started to have music acts at club ramesses and doctor and i wasn't just a red doctor york personally asked me to make these drives right and i was picking i picked the, i mean like for example just to give you one example like ted uh we call him musa um from the blue magic your old heads know the blue magic let the side show begin musa was a member of the ansar community um and so when the blue magic came to be uh in the um came to perform at ramesses um, I went and got them and I then was there with Doc. In fact, doc, the reason I was at the Thanksgiving dinner um, in this, I'm just trying to get the years right so y'all don't, in fall of 97 was because Pop said he wanted to thank me for all the help I had given um, at um, helping him with his with his personal, both his, the acts for Ramesses and his friends. This wasn't me just bringing people to the land. I was working for Pop's specifically he would make direct requests to me sometimes through the sisters and sometimes when i saw him in person he would ask me very specific questions so like the idea that this was i was just some random dude driving back and forth just isn't true um but that's that's sort of how people uh you know can tell a story if they weren't there or if they were there and didn't know me or they were there and don't remember um so so that's so that's that yeah okay um give us a little more detail because some of the people still feel a little confused before I do that, let me let everybody know that's in my chat room. What we are doing over here at the Sarnetta Studios, we are cleaning up house. We cleaning up the inside first. You know what I'm saying? So I advise you, if you get any negative comments, you might be blocked on the channel. If you ain't got nothing positive to uplift us, then we are gonna get rid of you. We ain't we ain't got no tolerance for no crazy stuff for no nigga mess that goes on. We cleaning up the channel. So. If you would like to stay a part of it and you can comment, that's cool. You can disagree, do it respectfully. But if you disrespectful, we blocking you. We not giving you no second chances. We not doing none of that. We cleaning up our channel. There's a lot of craziness going on on a lot of channels. That's all people got is negativity, negativity, negativity. We ain't a part of that stuff no more. We moving past that. So be careful what you write in the chat. You know, my, my moderators are trigger happy. And they ready to go. They ready to snap your head. So back to you, my brother. Oh, oh. yeah. You, you asked a question about when I left. That's the part I didn't. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I um I left Atlanta in 98, early 98, late 97, early 98, but I was still a member. Um, I was still going to class um with the sister Raina, and I can't remember what her mate's name was, but he ran his name begins with a J. But the sister in Philly, I, I was I was still attending his classes then. Um, I was still building with brothers. I was still turning money in. I was still active. Um, it wasn't until probably a year later, two years later, that I fully decided, like, in my mind that I'm completely out. It was kind of a phase out. There was no moment where I said, like, yo, I'm done. As much as there was just, as, as time went on, I read more and saw more contradictions and started putting two and two together. And then my crew from Atlanta was like, oh, you know, we, we just found out about this plagiarism. They started showing me the different books that had been plagiarized. And I was building with cats like that. Um, that's when I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. And you know, people say, you know, uh, I'm just thinking of specifically what the brother said, um, Pharaoh, because I, again, I, I take what he says seriously. Um, some of it we disagree on, some of it just isn't true. I just idea that I went back into a masjid to, you know, and whether I'm working on behalf of like Sunni Arabs or something like that, um, it, it wasn't true. I just, I just stopped, I just stopped supporting the doctrine because of what I had seen. Because what I knew, and I had to, I had a responsibility to to reconcile what I had seen with my own eyes, what I had heard, what I had read, with what my values were. And at this point, I was like, "Yo, I can't continue to be a part of this. I, I, I can't, I can't justify this. I can continue to advance information. I can still read. I can still build, but I, I, I can't be a part of this shit in the same way." 
Right. Um, a lot of people was a little confused. They they said, why the brother cut the story a little when you said you walked in on him? Can you are you leaving out anything, brother? Like you walked in on him doing what? Just with the kids on his yeah, lap? Yeah, yeah. Hey, give us a little more, man. What you what you walked in on? You know, like I said, I'll be very specific because I wasn't trying to give innuendo or or mislead the public. I was just I was saying what I saw and I I, I didn't leave anything out of the story. One of the things he said was that I was I entered an unauthorized area. Um, that, that's that's not true. Um, I was specifically told that I could go in any of the places. And remember, I was, and this goes back to the point. I was bringing people to Ramesses, so I was always in and out of Ramesses. There was a, there was a music studio upstairs. I was always in and out building with brothers. There was a brother Tarek who was doing music. There was a, um, there were people um, doing stuff in, in, inside and out. And so, honestly, Ramesses was the place that I was most likely to be, um, not least likely to be. Um, and they didn't tell me not to go there. Um, and they only said that because when I walked in, the kids were there. I'm not saying that in that moment that I walked in that I saw um, some wild sex act. If I had seen that, I would have obviously had a different reaction. You know what right. I mean? Um, this idea, uh, and one of the brothers said, well, if you saw something and didn't say nothing, then it's your fault. And it's like, well, no, I wouldn't say that. You know, um, I was a teenager. Um, but more importantly, you know, I think all of us inside of an organization, whether it's a religion, whether it's a cult, whether it's a, a gang, whether it's a, a family structure, we all make the sit, we all see fucked up shit and don't always respond to it. And I think it would be kind of crazy to blame. Um, it would be kind of crazy to blame the people who were on the, the victims of this or the friends of the victims for not speaking out and not the person who did the harm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, when I walked into the club to answer your question, though, um, and I wasn't told, uh, I walked in and somebody said something quickly to me. Yes. And I saw the kids. And yes, it was. It did make me uncomfortable. It, it it was a weird vibe. It wasn't just like, oh, some kids roller skating. That wasn't the time it was on. It's when I left at the brother. And I, I wish I could remember his name now. He's one of the old heads that work with Pops came outside, outside and told me, yo, don't ever do that again. Right. And he looked. um, um, I don't want to say panicked, but he looked very disturbed by it. Right. And, and he wasn't even angry as much. as was like, yo, like boom right um mind you this wasn't my only sign remember i had friends who told me what happened to them i had mm. people who told me what happened to their sim i said that in the interview too that part got ignored right i i, I like people say yo i don't want to go here because i'm afraid of what's going to happen or you know i don't i don't like to go into his house alone because you know, of what happened to my sister, yeah, right? And, and this was shit that was starting to be said as I was leaving and I was hearing it and not hearing it. I was hearing it, but but sort of ignoring it uh, because I didn't want to believe it, right? I was invested in not believing it. Was that a mistake of mine? Yeah, I would say, yeah, if I, if I knew what I know now, I don't know what I would do differently, but I, I would do something differently. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's crazy to me because there's so many young people right now who will still tell you they were molested. Who will still tell you that what happened to them? And this mm -hmm. idea that everybody's lying, that everybody made it up, that it is to me that's so implausible. And why, why believe? That? What's the investment in believing that? But I think we got another brother on here, so I want to yes, take yeah. Let me um let me introduce another brother, powerful brother that been out here giving up this information, doing great work. I love your background, first of all, brother. Love your background, oh, honest, whatever. Honest. you know we we. Hey, we um, this is another brother who have also. This brother have also been a member of Dr. York Camp, Brother Lord Abba. Before you go on and ask our brother some questions, mm -hmm. um, when did you um, become a member of Dr. York Camp? And have you ever met him personally? No, no, I never. By the time I got into New Wapu, Dr. York was, was well, no, nah, he wasn't locked up yet. I was trying to get down there. I had joined the ancient Egyptian order when I was still living in Brooklyn. So then mm. I had moved from Far Rockaway to Brooklyn. Um, I had started studying about 98, 99. My, my new Apple story is kind of interesting of how I got into it. I never tell that portion of the story. I only just answer the, the questions about 
the Sarnetta asks me every time we do an interview. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, so let's get into some of the stories you never told us real quick. Uh, real no, quick. I'm not. I don't want to get okay, into Okay, we'll do our own show on that, brother. Yeah, because it, anyway, it's, I mean, it's just some mystical stuff that's just, that's, that's all it is. Everything in my life was a path that led me to a point right here and right now to whereas I'm sitting on a platform with Sarnetta who's interviewing Mark Lamar Hill. Mark Lamar Hill just interviewed Dr. William Sandy Darity, who just shouted out our organization, the Descendants of Freedmen, yeah, wow. out here, out here pushing for reparations, and one of Mark Lamar Hill's colleagues who wrote this excellent book right here. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we interviewed him on Be the Power as well. So everything that has happened in my life has led me to this point right here. And, and the story is still being written, basically. Okay, so brother, I bring on Lord Abba. Lord Abba, I got a couple of questions for you, my brother, uh, Mark Lamont. Lamont. So oh, go ahead, definitely. brother, the floor is yours, brother. Oh, peace, peace. Um, I don't know, <laughs> you, I, I, I tweet, after your last interview with Sarnetta, I tweeted at you. And you know, some people jumped on my tweet and they had some comments and you, actually responded to one of the tweets. Oh, so well, I'll yeah, you have, yeah, it was, yeah, I'm pretty certain you get a lot of tweets and you got to ignore a lot of that stuff. But, um, you know, I've, I've had some, some issues with certain liberal politics, right? Over the years, I've probably tweeted at you a couple times or two over okay. something that I've disagreed with. I mean, that, that's, that's neither here nor, nor there at this point, but on on the issue of reparations, I would really like to know your position. And I, let me kind of qualify the question a little bit, because um, it is said that you are of of um, West Indian background. Is that true? No, he was just making up. They no. just what, making what background, okay. Lord Abba? You said a what? West Indian background. Oh, okay. Caribbean, I, basically. I heard I'm Jamaican. I heard I'm Croatian. I heard Croatian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this, this is my problem with with some of the ADOS movement, right? It becomes mm -hmm. like a witch hunt, right? It becomes like it, it's they, we almost sound like white nationalists talking about where you from. I I heard you're not really black. I heard you're not really mm -hmm. from here. I'm now the foreigner to the reparations movement because I'm Jamaican, right? I'm not Jamaican, just to be clear, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. if I was, does that really mean that I can't be part of the movement? When we kick Malcolm out for his origins, when we kick out Marcus Messiah Garvey for his origins, right? I mean, to me, the question has to be a different one. But to be clear, mm -hmm. to be clear, to answer the question I think is coming, mm -hmm. I believe in reparations for the, um, for the descendants of American slavery. Mm -hmm. I believe the mm -hmm. people who are of Caribbean descent do have a, 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 a grievance. And I think their grievance is not with the U.S. government, but with what? The, with, with, with the, there's a Caribbean movement for um for for um that's right for that's for right. Uh, for reparations. Mm -hmm. I believe that to meet the standard of reparations in the United States, you should have a you should be connected to a descendant of slaves, Indeed. American slavery. Mm -hmm. To be clear, my father Leon Hill was born in 1928. Mm -hmm. His father L M was born 42 years before. I'm just doing the math. Mm -hmm. um, and his father. They born in Wilkes County, Georgia, and his father uh, was 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 a slave. Okay. So, no, uh, no, no. So, so you don't even got just to be clear. You don't even got to go that. I, you don't even got. There, that, wait, but wait, wait, I'll just let me first yeah. and foremost. I'm not a part of the ADOS movement. I know. You know I know. I'm, I'm speaking yeah, to them. Okay. Who okay. No. Okay. Because yeah. but I, I was rocking with them for a little minute, and my group and I be the power. Shout out to my brother. Yeah, they Lonnie. flipped on you. They flipped on you. <laughs> they flipped on me. You know, Yvette Carnell, Antonio Moore. And hello minions because you know we was just becoming popular in in that particular movement and i think they seen us as a threat oh, which okay. was crazy because we was just trying to add on to the conversation and build from see we come from out the conscious community mm -hmm. former five percenters former new Opians, former nation of islam members former whatever you know what i'm saying so we come out of that and we were able to chuck a lot of the bad information and, and hold on to the good parts, even if it was just a hand full of things. And we carried that with us into our next phase of consciousness, which is don't just fight the power, become the power, and then you'll have the power to make a change. And this is why we push politics on our platform, be the power. So the question 
basically was centered around, and, and I'm glad you answered it the way that you did. And, and let me say this, right? One of the things that we've noticed uh, on Be The Power a few nights ago, we had <laughs> this brother from the Caribbean on. And it was a debate about reparations. And there was this white guy who was actually from Canada. Like you had no, he wanted to be a part of the debate. So we let him on. We are equal opportunity cookers <laughs> on our channel. We cook everybody. Right. So we let them on. And this Caribbean guy, right? He speaks all right wing talking points. He speaks as if he wasn't a black man himself. So I think this is why the brown paper bag test, if you will, comes up in the conversation of reparations, because I don't know if you if you see it, but we see it. We, you know what I'm saying? You're in the media, but those of us that are so heavily invested in reparations who craft our political fight and platform around reparations, our ears are open to it all. So when we hear the Candace Owens', Candace Owens is, or somebody like Kingface who, who passed last year, et cetera, and we start looking at their background, we're like, well, okay, well, what's going on? And there's yeah. this hate against the descendants of freedmen in the United States of America. There was a, a 2003 or 2013 maybe article published on it. I was just sharing that out uh, earlier today and yesterday about, about that fact. So we have to be guarded right now. And I think the only way that we can really get um, several layers of understanding is by having direct conversations on it. So then you don't think that we're looking at Jamaicans, et cetera, as the enemy. We're not. We're All saying, right, brother, yeah, we need question, y'all to brother. help us. Ask your we, question. Well, he answered the question. Are we just having a conversation okay. right now? All right, so, but I'll ask, I'll ask another question. Being that your, your colleague, came onto our platform and I just gave a breakdown. We would love to have you come on be the power for for a discussion. We had a good we had a good conversation with, yeah. with Charles Blow. Say less. I got you. Say Definitely. less. I got you. I'll be there. All right, cool. I'm a, what what I'll do is I'll get in contact with Sarnetta and you might email, email me and we'll okay, work definitely. it. Definitely. And yeah. I'll send you the video of the interview we did with Charles Blow. It was really good. Okay, matter of fact, before we get off, let me ask you that question. What do you think about Charles Blows's Southern strategy. That's what we call it, to move our people from those, what he calls destination cities, back into the South so that we can be uh, political majorities in Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, North Carolina. Yeah, I, I, and I, I need, I, I read the book and mm -hmm. I, I agree with Charles that we need to, we need to develop. Um, by the way, uh, random side note, Kyle Lowry just signed a three-year deal with the Miami Heat. So, ah. Man, exactly. we were talking about this before. That's why before we went live. Me and Lamont was talking about what's going on with the NBA series. So, damn. So, so the Knicks we ain't going to get nobody. Right. We ain't getting, getting nobody, nobody, man. But, well, that's um, the Knicks. I mean. But, 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 right. Fact. But look, I, I, I agree with moving Southern um, mm -hmm. to build bases of power, but understand that what, however we move, the state is always going to reconfigure its, its laws and its rules in such a way to disempower us, whether they, how they draw voting districts, how they... Uh, how they do the the uh, the the electoral college? All these things can shift if black people are winning. It's not like black people have been not working hard enough or strategizing enough. Is that the rule? The game is rigged in a way that we don't win. Um, so I like the idea of building bases of power. But for me, it's about. But I I wouldn't want to abandon the north either. So for me, it's about saying, all right, we can have concentrations of power in the south, so we can control those states in a way that white folk control Wyoming. People mad at D.C. becoming a state. D.C. got more people in it than the whole state of Wyoming. Right. So there's a way that we should be able to have that power. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's about figuring out how we can develop economic power as well, how we can develop a base of economic power for our communities so that we don't need to only appeal to the state for our benefits. We're citizens. We deserve what, what, what everybody deserves. But I want black folk to do for self and build that. And for me, that doesn't necessarily have to happen exclusively in the South. OK, well, I, I would love for you to come on the platform. We have some very sharp political minds on our platform oh, no. we're all gearing up to run for office as well so you know shout out shout out to you brother for for giving your testimony man um appreciate you king yo how that i said i got you all right definitely shout out to my big bro sarnetta all right peace lord abba peace, peace. And look at, 
All right. Hey, um, I know you got to get off and get ready for your show you got coming up lately. Let me I, ask you this, I, I, brother. I could do like 15, 20 more, man. Just, I'm having a good time, man. I just, All right, like, good. Five eight, you know where Beautiful. Is. Yeah. Um, what is what is the beef, or should I say, misunderstanding between you and um Tariq Nasheed? I don't have beef with Tariq Nasheed. I, I've never met Tariq Nasheed. I've never said a bad word about him. Man, I don't agree with everything he says, and I, clearly he doesn't agree with me. Oh, okay. But when for me, from my perspective, and I'd be happy to build with the brother. You know what I mean? Um, we got to find a way within our community to build on stuff, disagree on stuff without it being personal, without right. assuming that the worst in each other, assuming everybody's an op, everybody's an Asian, everybody's trying to bring the people, to, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, right. I agree with Tariq Nasheed on a lot of stuff. Uh, and quite frankly, sometimes I just think he's funny as hell. He's a good, you know what I mean? So, you know, even when he, he, he was joking about my hairline saying, I don't got an FBA hairline, I was, I was cracking up. <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't know, you know, but other than that, man, I'm, I'm not really thinking about any kind of exchange with brothers or sisters that's, that's contentious, unless it has okay. to be. Good. You know what I mean? I don't got no beef with the brother. You know what I mean? Like I said, if, this, if there's issues that we can build on and agree on, Cool, let's do it. If there's areas of disagreement, I want to create space for brothers and sisters to disagree on those issues um, okay. without being enemies to each other. All right. Peace and Black Power family. Let the world know who you are. I know who you are, but let the world know who you are, brother. Uh, peace and family. This is uh, Brother Reggie. And, uh, What's going on, great. Dr. Reggie? Uh, did you? Um, I put in the chat that uh, Dr. Winoko Rashid, the ancestor, he uh, passed away with heart attack and Kimmich. Um, brother, brother Jabari is there. Yeah. Uh, so he's there. So just let an audience know that Dr. Rebecca is uh, she was ancestor. But I want hold to up. Ask, uh, hold, hold, hold up. Hold up. I missed it. The, you said what? Dr. Renoko Rashidi passed away in Kemet with a heart attack. Um, brother Jabari is in Kemet. Yo, that's crazy, um, Reggie. You know why? Because he was supposed to come on my show soon. Like yeah. within some time next week. Oh, man. Renoko Rashidi? Yes. So, oh, uh, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Oh, man. Sad to be ancestor. God. You know who that is, right, Mark? Yeah. Lamar? yeah. Oh, man. man. This must have just happened. Uh, yeah, Jafari called Brother Small and Brother Small, you know, you know, I work with Professor Small. So uh he so he called me and so I called you. Yeah, Jabari uh, went to Kimmet yesterday, Sunday. He'll be out there for twenty days. Well, they're gonna have to work on um either uh, getting the body back Damn, in the man, state. That's crazy. So that's when he passed away, was he in France or was he in oh you said he was in Kemet? Yeah, he's in Kemet, yeah. Lord. Uh, yeah, so so he has one relative that they are trying to locate, I think a niece. So they're trying to locate her, but uh, depending on uh, what Jabari uh, says and what that group says, we may all have to contribute to either bring the body back, uh, and uh, or uh, and to figure out funeral arrangements and chemistry. Brother, let so, me know, let me know what's needed to bring his body back, and I'll, I'll certainly contribute to it, my brother. Uh, I, he was a giant. Yeah, man. Damn, man. Yeah. So I'll Thank let, you for uh, that news, Reggie, man. Thank you, brother. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, uh, okay, uh, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Hill. Um, well, my name is Brother Reggie. I am the author of the Black City Plan, right? And um, in the Black City Plan, the Black City Plan is dealing with our majority Black populations that are already in the cities. We live in the city, we die, we pay rent, our jobs are there. Uh, actually, most of our culture is in the city. And so I believe in a city plan, just like white folks believe in a city plan, whereas the Mormons took over uh, cities and uh, the Irish, the Italians, and the Jews. And so uh, the only difference with my city plan, of course, is that it's for black people to look at their, understand their own power. If you don't control the city, you don't control, uh, uh, you don't control the local laws. You don't uh, control the local economics. And so the last part I'll uh, make, and, and, and then I'll listen to you, is is the fact that when we control our city, then we can uh, uh, create municipal enterprises. Municipal enterprises are 
city-run businesses to take over our food, shelter, clothing, and cable. The city can do that. We don't need these uh, pariah uh, corporations uh, sucking us dry when the city can take over Lyft services and Uber services and things like that because they already licensed them. They just have to buy the licenses for the software. So what do you think? generally about the way to go instead of necessarily moving to the South, right? Uh, which is uh, um, difficult places to navigate. And I am from the South. But to uh, ask our people to uh, give them a plan to take care of uh, uh, the control of their local cities. That's, I, I'd like to hear your comment. Yeah, I, um, thank you for that question. And again, thank you for letting us know um... Wow, about the passing of our our, our beloved ancestor, um, who um, was a giant in helping us understand who we are as a people and the relationship between our people um, and the continent in, in particular. Um, to answer your question, um, I think that controlling our cities where we are matters. I think that means creating economics, economic infrastructures in our cities, our businesses um, that are centered around us. It means making a conscious effort as African people to invest in each other. Meaning that, yeah, I might pay 50 cent more to go to Sarnetta's uh, co coffee shop than to go to Starbucks. But I know that that 350 I'm spending instead of the $3 at Starbucks is going to be circulating in my community because when Sarnetta gets that 350, Sarnetta's going to go to a black dry cleaner. Sarnetta's going to go to a black restaurant. Sarnetta's going to go to a black store to get um, you know, to buy beauty products for his, for his, for his, for his sister or for his mother or for his wife, right? This is, this is the, the idea of, of building in the community. So I, I think part of it is that I do think we need local political power as well. Uh, the brother said, who just came off to run for office. I agree. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with running for office. As long as you don't invest your faith in the political system as the solution. In other words, we're not going to vote our way to freedom. But voting is a tactic and a strategy that we can use that is helpful. I'd rather have somebody on our side in office than someone who is not. I'd rather have Charles Barron, right, in New York, for example, than some than some other person who hates black people. I'd rather have somebody who has a profound love for black folk. That for me is the idea. So tactically organizing, building political strength, um, running for office, having our own businesses, spending in our own business, also educating our children, right? At some point, we have to educate our children with our values, our tradition, our curriculum, our ideas. Um, that for me is critical. And so, so for me, that can happen in the South. So the opposing argument is that uh, um, not, Lord, you know, Lord Abba and me, we uh, kind of uh, uh, debate all the time, but we're both looking for a solution. My, my solution is that, that we are um, people people's culture, black people's culture is usually the city in which they are in, right? Mm -hmm. And to pack, pack their bags and leave to another city, right? Creates another problem. But at the same time, our trillion dollar industry is our music and our sports, right? Uh, and so our entertainment and our sports and our talents, right? And these are grown cities. And so if we can uh, convince our cities uh, through through changing leadership, then we could uh, gestate uh, economic power with the power that's already been exploited. So we, so the movies, every movie now has a black person, and you can't make a movie without with black people without being in a black city. So you got to go to Chicago, you got to go to New York, you got to go to Detroit, you got to go, and so, but these, and they're making stories on us. Our cities have to be able to control that. Right. Instead of having a rock nation come into all of our cities, our cities need to be uh, our own rock nations in the track and then talk to other cities. I agree. So, OK, so I just uh, that's the and, and cities also give us de facto reparations. Because if we can control our cities, well, then we can control our land. I don't know about that, brother. I, 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 that's what we probably disagree with. De facto. I said de facto, oh, de facto reparations. Okay. okay, de facto, yes. I'm mean, just to be clear, so your reparations folk don't get mad at me because I'm a reparations person. I'm not saying I don't agree with reparations. I just think it should come from the federal government, not these state governments, because the federal government did the crime to us, and second, they got the money. 
but the the fact, right. but your point about states giving us de facto reparations vis a vis cities, 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 cities get de facto cities. reparations. De facto, I'm all, I'm all for as long as it doesn't undermine the federal, the project the, the, uh, we have of getting reparations through the U.S. government. Because that I agree with wholeheartedly. All right, all right, we got to move forward, Doctor Reggie. Thank you because right, he ain't got that you. much time left. Yeah, no, um, no problem. But I am, you, yeah, I'm not anybody, Sarnetta. I'm not anybody. I know so that you the man, you the man, bro. All right, peace. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you. Peace. Hey, uh, brother, brother Lamont. Um, Shout out to Chuck Morgan. Shout out to Chuck Morgan. My brother. That's my brother. I hope we can get I, Chuck I know. That's why I said shout out to Chuck Morgan. It would be powerful if you two was on the bill together. Man. Let's, let's do, you know, you know what? We're going to say it right now. Public. Me and Chuck going to do something together in the next seven days. All right. Beautiful. Life. Whenever you whenever you got time and space, we can do it in, in tomorrow. We can do it whenever. Yeah, he's in the chat. He shouted you out. He shouted you out. He's yeah, I've been going through the chat, man. I just got I got I got the chance to uh see Chuck in person a couple weeks ago and build with him. So yeah, was, yeah. You went out there, y'all sit down, y'all sat down, ate dinner. Yeah, and the food looked good too. I'm looking food, at it. Food was food was good, man. Him and his him and his lady came out, man. It was it was it was good, man. It was good to, it was good to uh to see him again in the build with cats. Yeah, man. See, y'all two get together. I don't think nobody messing with y'all when it comes to this history dealing yeah, with Dr. Want, York. <laughs> no, they don't want the smoke. And that's what killed me. Can I just say, there was a couple things that came up that, that the brother Farrell said that, I, that bugged me out a little bit. And I went back and I, I went back and started reading the old books just to make sure I wasn't like losing my mind. And uh -huh. a couple things he was, he was fact checking me. He, he, was, he, he made the argument that Nuwapik is a language. Um, oh, man. And I'm just I'm gonna just go through this real quick. I he's right. Nuwabic is a language. That's what we call a straw man, right? Like I never argued Nuwabic wasn't a language. What I argued was that it wasn't an ancient language, right? I could make a language tomorrow. It's a language, and I think that a black man making his own language for a community or a black woman making a language for a community is fine. It's dope. Um, the only question is, is it a ancient language? And the answer for me is no. He says that. And this, that, that, that the new topic that I was taught, and again, he said, I didn't ask the right questions. I was, I asked Dr. York. So if Dr. York wasn't the right person to ask, please direct me to who the right person to ask is about new topic. But when I asked Dr. York specifically himself, face to face in real life, what new topic was, he said the same thing that he said on some of the audio tapes that you can hear that are on YouTube. He said that it was that, that the version that I learned and I, that I taught, I also taught new topic, right? So it wasn't just that I learned it, I taught new topic. Um, was was ancient cuneiform that's what he said it was that's what was in the books and when you break down that version of nuabic um it was not cuneiform he said that um i was that, that it was a hodgepodge of stuff from and, and that's true um that that nubic became a hodgepodge of, of the kids who were learned who spoke arabic and they basically learned it, it created their own dialect of arabic that's true um but um, Nuwabic was supposed to be something different. That it was the next step past Nubic, and I'm saying that it wasn't it wasn't ancient. He said every sovereign nation has a language council. That's not true. Many sovereign nations have language councils. Um, and 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 I think it's dope to have a language council. But the United States doesn't have a language council, a formal language council to prove upon. You know, in Spain they have Real Academia. In 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 uh, in the Arab world they do have one. Um, but not every language. It's a minor point, but every language doesn't have doesn't have a language council. But I think a language council is dope. And again, I have no issue with Nuwapik. It's but but I think when you subject it to some scrutiny, you see that it's not um what, what he said it was. Um he said that I misrepresented Dr. York's claim about um his father, who his father was. The issue that came up when I asked Dr. York a question in 97 was that Dr. York said in the Constitution of the United Nuwabian Nation of Moors book, he and it was also in the newsletter that he published, that he was the son of David York, right? And that he was the spiritual son of El Hadi Abdurrahman, the, the spiritual son. And so I raised my hand and said, "All this time, you told us that you were the blood son of um, of El Hadi Abdurrahman, and not the son of David York." But now that he was tying himself into the Native American lineage, he said something um, different, and that's where the issue came. And so it wasn't me confusing the father side and the mother side. Um, I'm just going to do a couple more of these quick ones now. And, and if Nuwabi wants to jump on, I'm, I have a couple minutes. Um, uh, again, he said the extent of my membership. I mean, you can people can debate that all they want. I, I don't know how else to, to say it. I mean, I, we started a Nuwabi 
fraternity and sorority called Nisi Fee. I hold was, on, I hold on. Knew. New New University TV. Call it in. Call it in. New University TV. Let's go. All right, gay brother. Sorry. Yeah. About. We started Nisi Fee, the, the Nuwabian uh, fraternity and sorority. Right. I was one of the founding members of it. Like at Savior's Day, I did the performance of it. And I mean, like, so if y'all were there or y'all got access to video, y'all can see this. So the idea that I wasn't there or I, and, and Pops is literally co-signing what I'm saying. I'm talking and Pops is like, that's right. I mean, like, you know, and so it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Wow. Wow. So and, 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 anyway, and, and so then I showed you one of the videos. I showed you and uh, Brother Jabari one of the videos of me on the land in front of everybody, including Pops. So like, I don't know. That, that, that's kind of bonkers to me. In fact, in one of the books, Pops has me. As Dr. York has me as one as a prominent Nuwabian in one of the books he's published since he was incarcerated. So if Pops is calling me a prominent Nuwabian, I don't know how y'all are disagreeing with him on that, but that's on y'all. Um, Dr. York, and when the brother comes in, I'll happily stop. He's saying Dr. York has a degree uh, in Arabic from the University of Khartoum. That's not that has been that's completely untrue, and I could I could demonstrate that in many ways. But in Dr. York has a GED course he's taking in the prison. And we have copies of his GED progress report. So if Dr. York has a PhD, why is he taking GED classes in Colorado prison? Just a question for New Orleans, if y'all can answer that. Um, he says he has a degree in 1975. He's also said his degree in 1973. Farrell, the brother said he, he has a degree from University of Khartoum. Dr. York himself actually says he got it in Azhar in Egypt in 1973, but he also says he left in 1973. So he got a lot of degrees from a lot of places in a lot of different years. And y'all, he he sort of dismissed my idea of saying that Dr. York um, spoke Arabic. Where's the proof? I keep asking, but where's the proof? Where, where, where is it? Where is the, Where's the video of him having a conversation in Arabic? Where's the video of him having a conversation in Arabic? Where's the video of him translating something actively in Arabic? I'm not saying reading a, a, a line from the Quran. There's a, there's a, you, where's the clip? I, I said, I got 10 stacks on it. And I, it's been, it's been what a month. I still ain't, I, I heard, I, I, I still got the 10 stacks. So I got, I got to ask, you know, what, what, what that is about that. In the Ansar cult book, the rebuttal to the slanders, he said he was born in Omdurman, in Sudan. He's always talked about being born in Sudan. That was the point. He says, you can go to the hall of records in Sudan and find it. And yet he also said in the Yanun book that he was born in Ghana, the actual facts book I'm talking about. You know what I mean? So again, I could go on and on and on. You know, he said he's it's a fact that he's a Liberian diplomat. How come Liberia don't know? When you call mm. it, when you call the Liberian embassy, they say he's not. Where's the evidence? The only thing he showed was a passport of him as a youth Liberian diplomat, which I think Chuck Morgan has shown. And when you look at the video, I mean the picture, he's wearing a prison uniform. It's clearly a fake video. How you how you taking a, a, a how are you taking that in, in a prison uniform, right? Um, so according to your knowledge, brother. Yeah. Um, have Dr. York ever been to Kemet? To my knowledge, um, you know, I don't know. I don't want to speak on that because I don't know the answer to that. I've seen him, pictures of him in Sudan, and I find it hard to believe. I, I, let me put it differently. I could, I don't, I've never seen the evidence of him in Kemet, but it would not shock me if he stopped in Egypt on his way from Sudan. I used I, to I, bang, I, I used to bang hard body on the Nuwabias. I'm talking about like in, in, in the 2000s, early in the 2000s, I used to go in on them hard body because I didn't like the symbol that they did. I always said y'all desecrated the symbol. The and I'm talking about the unk. Yep. How you put a dead man on a goddamn unk symbol like, right. like Jesus Christ. Like Jesus. And I used to, hey, I'm talking about way back in the days, we used to go at it on the 125th. And yep. I'd be like, nah, brother, that, that, that right there is like desecration. You try to make this like a damn cross. Like That's a dead right. man, when the when the um, symbolizes life, you put a dead man on a damn cross. Like I couldn't it's get it, I didn't you. understood it, and we used to go in on that right there. What do you think about that now that you're on the outside looking in? Because well, I know I, when you was in there, you probably didn't really think of it like that. No, but what do you think about? He it? broke it down because again, on the Nuwabian, uh, I got my arms back. On the Nuwabian uh, symbol here at the top was a six pointed star and a crescent. And inside of it is that unk with the man on it. So at the time, it made sense to me because he gave us a reason for all every piece of this, right? Yeah. What was the reason? Um, I believe. 
You know, I don't remember. Honestly, God, I don't. <laughs> right, right. I don't, I don't, I don't want Moose. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember. But looking back on it, I'm like, we had. I see it as a pattern of taking a symbol or a tradition that's already existing, dismantling right. it, and then taking it back and making it seem as if they did it wrong, but I can do it right. Right. Being a Christian is crazy until he's Reverend York. Right. Being being Muslim is wrong unless we end Saudi, right? Being a Mason was demonic until we started a lodge, right? And 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 so all of these things, uh, um, he said, a symbol of our suffering. That's what it was. Yes, a symbol of our suffering here in the United States. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Yeah, about. well, that's what the church is saying too. A symbol of our suffering. That's yeah. no different from Jesus hanging on the cross, looking at a symbol of their suffering. So right. I look at it as a symbol of death, and you desecrated the unk symbol by adding on to it. That's not cool. Leave it the way the ancestors left it, brother. That's right. the brother that said he want to come in here, body all of y'all. Uh, new, new University TV. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I mean, you know, we ain't got a lot of time, but if New University, nah, he ain't coming in. He they say, he just talking because I told him to come on in. But right. nah, you can't add to the symbol of our ancestors. They was not here. That's not what the unk meant to them. You see, mm -hmm. do that on your own culture. Create your own culture, and you create that for yourself. Don't don't come over here and try to mess up the culture of what our um, our ancestors have done. So, yo, brother, I want to just say thank you for coming through, brother. I'm not gonna hold you too long. Um, you got the clothes out. Let the people know where they can see you. You getting ready to do a show right now? Is this gonna be live as well, brother? Yeah, it's live. It's a uh, Black News tonight. It comes on Black News Channel. Uh, BNC, uh, it's on uh, all the cable network spectrum, uh, Fios, uh, Comcast, all of them. Um, Black News Channel or BNC. Uh, tonight we build it on a bunch of stuff. Um, we, we start in Black August, the, you know, Black August every every year we celebrate Black August, which you know, the commemoration of George Jackson who was killed uh, mm. by police or, or by you know, while while uh, while in, in prison in, in, in California. We're talking about the legend, the legacy of Asada Shakur. We're talking about the legacy of Angela Davis awesome. continues to build. So, you know, we are, um, we're talking about Black August. We're talking about Black voting rights. We're talking about, um, of course, today's the birthday of the great James Baldwin. We're talking about that. Um, so watch the show. We have a YouTube channel, BNC News, but also watch it live if you can, man. We're going to keep the show going. But the show was doing well. I'm glad to build with folk. Me and Chuck going to definitely get on here and rap and build uh, hopefully this week. Um, and you know, I'm always open to build with cats, man. Like I said, it's all love. I ain't got no beef with nobody. I ain't got no issue right. with nobody. We can hold on. We got a call. Just call yeah. them. Peace and black power family. What's your name and where you calling from? Yes, sir. Uh, this is, this is bang up in Queens born in Brooklyn. Yeah. I just wanted to, uh, ask real quick, uh, Mr. Uh, Landman about Dr. Yogi. Y'all yeah, yeah, 42. I was born in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. I'm one of y'all. Y'all already know. Y'all already know what it is. Born in uh, Cumberland Hospital, Mike Tyson Hospital. But anyway, um, I just wanted to say about Dr. York. Was he well-read? Like, was he a well-learned person? Like, did he promote peace and learning? Because uh, as a black person that was been in the all my life, I would think learning is the key. Like, us learning as people is the key. So I would think that I don't know everything about this guy, Dr. York, but you know, I asked my father uh, last night about him, and it's crazy how y'all talk about this shit today. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, from what I've seen, from what I've learned and uh, what i studied about, he's, he's like a well-read person, and he wrote a lot of books. So uh, I would think like he's a good icon for I, I'm gonna speak for myself. I think he's a good icon for me because he's well learned. He he likes to read and, and learn. And I was let me ask you a question, brother. Uh, do you think yeah. that, do you think that uh, T D Jakes, the Christian minister, do you think he's well read and learned? Um, I just I just read. He wrote a lot of books. I know he wrote a lot of books. So you gotta have some type of. How about George Bush? How about George Bush? I guess my my what I'm getting at, brothers. A lot of people have read a lot of stuff. Doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean that what they've read they've read it properly. Doesn't mean they teach it well. Doesn't mean that they that they um have the best intentions. Doctor York is brilliant, man. I mean, there's no way you can build what he built and not be brilliant. There's no way that you can have people um following you 
two, almost two decades after going to prison for ch as a child molester, after having your, your 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 work debunked, after being caught as a plagiarist, and still have people following and spending their money, time, and energy on this shit, unless you are some kind of genius. Now, the question for me is not, is Dr. Yves Smart and has he read books? Although he has not read as much as he has suggested he's read, because so much of his work is plagiarized. So if the work is plagiarized, and we say he's a scholar because he's Dr. York, but he doesn't have a PhD. And, you know, um, then how can we assess that intellect of his? I think it's okay to say, look, I admire Dr. York building a community. I think it's okay to say I admire Dr. York trying to get us to learn and think outside the boundaries of, of Western thought and, and particularly white supremacist thought. Um, I'm, with, I'm with you on all of that. But when you get to the specifics of the doctrine and you're telling me that I have to believe in the specifics of the doctrine, you know, and people say, well, you don't have to believe it, check it out. Well, when you check it out and subject it to any scrutiny, what you find, brother, is, and I'll let you, I, wanna, I don't want to cut you off, I just want to finish this thought. Um, when you subject, subject it to any scrutiny, you don't find that, the, that it bears out. Even his own, that's why I'm focusing on the biography, um, because the biography um, is, a, it, it, the fact that he lies on all of these things means that it becomes much more difficult to trust him on these issues where there's a gap. And if you say, well, we're not going to trust him, we need to check everything out, then check out, show me where there is proof uh, about an Egyptian god being a hermaphrodite, for example, right? Which And, and, and when Jabari pressed him on that, the, the brother Pharaoh, he, at some point he was like, well, you know, we're just going to agree to disagree, but where's the evidence? And basically what he said is, how can you prove that it's not true, right? Which is which, which is crazy, right? I, I, you know, so anyway, all that to say for me, it's not about... I, if you want to follow Dr. York as an example of a scholar, I think there are better examples. Follow Dr. John Henry Clark. Follow Arthur Schomburg. You know, I mean, we could think of a million people we could follow that would be better better than that. You know what I'm saying? So for me, that's how I think about it, brother. Thank you, brother, for the call. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Y'all have a good day. All right, peace. All right, brother, uh, winding it down. Go ahead, you got to close out. That's the last call for the day, and we moving forward. Hopefully, we'll get our brother back in next week, see what's up, him and Chuck Morgan, and um, we'll rock from there. Peace to you, brother. Peace. Yeah. Hey, let's get these likes up, y'all, on your way out, man. Come on, man. Show some love to me, man. Show some love to us. Get the likes up. We got um, over a 1,000 people in here watching. Let's get the likes up. Anything you want to close out with, my brother? Nah, man. Just peace, peace and love to the community, man. Let's when you gonna invite me to the bookstore, your bookstore in Philly? I yo, come through. Yo, two especially weeks if you have somebody there, I come through for y'all, man. Yo, we we starting to open up full time. You know, we've been on these COVID hours. We about to be back full swing in about two okay. weeks. Okay, come through. We'll do a whole side of show from there. And then we'll oh watch. man, let's yes, it. let's do yeah. it. All right, peace to you, my brother. Peace. peace. Thank you for coming through. All right, man. Y'all already see what it is. Hey, I'm gonna tell you something. What time is it? Oh. Okay. 20 minutes after uh, 7. Listen, 20 minutes after 7, y'all. I'm coming right back within five minutes. I got to come back. I got something powerful to show y'all. You want to have your ass in the building. I'm hoping they don't hit me for it, but I got to show it to you. This is Hunt 25th Street Talk, and I'm coming back within. It'll only take me maybe five minutes to get it in. All right? Peace and black power.